Babylon Park after two years, and we'll have some case studies um, from, from some of the institutions at, in the park. So before we get started, let me give you a quick overview. Um, it's a very large panel, not quite as large as the one I was in, but um, uh, again, my name is Vivian Conhagen, the Deputy Director at the Museum of Photographic Arts. We have Rich Cherry at the end, uh, Director of Bevel Park Online Collaborative, Perry and Sully, Digital Asset Management and Online Access at the BPOC, uh, Marin Doherty, Senior Editor at BPOC, um, Christy Emmerich Burgess, uh, Library Archives and Digitation Manager at the Minge International Museum, and Joaquin Ortiz, Digital Interpretations Manager at the Museum of Photographic Arts. Um, just a highlight of the session today, I'm going to give a quick introduction, then Rich Cherry is going to come up and talk about uh, cell phone adventures. Uh, Perian will talk about digital asset management. Uh, Maren is going to talk about a Google ad campaign. Christy will talk about converting tapes to files, and Joaquin will talk about interactives for uh, the gallery space and streetwise exhibition. And then we'll make sure we'll leave time for questions and answers. Um, just to give a quick overview of Babel Park, it began in 1868 with 1,400 acres of land set aside by the city. And there are two main expositions that essentially created Babel Park in the buildings and gardens that are in there. There was the 1915 Panama California Exposition and the 1935 Exposition. Um, this is what the park looks like today. We are just outside of downtown San Diego. Um, it's home to over 30 cultural institutions, um, all in this wonderful setting with uh, recreation areas, uh, gardens, and cultural um, buildings. Um, so some of the areas in here, we have uh, our botanical gardens, our lily pond, um, our Japanese friendship garden down at the very bottom. Um, like I said, it's also for recreation. You can find lawn bowling going on in Bevo Park. And home to some of the uh, some great cultural institutions, we have the Old Globe, um, the Museum of Photographic Arts, the Minge, and the Japanese Friendship Garden. Just a highlight of some of the institutions in here. And of course, we're home to the San Diego Zoo. So here's your panda fix if anybody's into pandas. <laughs> <coughs> Um, so let me tell you a little bit about the online collaborative. It started in 2009 to address common technical issues faced by the organizations in Babo Park. And the goal is to also improve public access to the rich collections that are and resources that are there. Um, it's also been a platform for collaboration among all the institutions and in a way, in a technological way and helping us understand what our audience will need in the 21st century. Um, here's just a list of some of the, of the partners. We have over 23? 27. 27 now. 27 partners in the online collaborative. Um, so everything from um, <coughs> the cultural partnership, which is a group which is made out of the directors of the Bell Park, um, of uh, the various institutions, to the zoo, to um, the ballet, and um, the other in institutions here. Um, Bell Park Online Collaborative has been around for two years and has done an amazing job of creating all sorts of um, technology initiatives. Um, they've launched more than 20 websites, uh, built a high speed fiber optic network connecting 14 buildings, um, digitized more than 170,000 images, videotapes, and audio files. They've developed mobile applications. Um, MOPA, I believe, has the first institution one that you created, so come and visit MOPA's uh, mobile application. Um, there's a cell phone adventure-based game that we'll talk about. Um, they also provide <laughs> infrastructure such as IT support, um, support for gallery interactives, and they've also provided training for all the staff. Um, so I'm going to turn this over to Rich Cherry, who's going to talk about um, his project. nice to actually come up and do a presentation and not have to do all the background. First time ever, I think, for these conferences. Okay. 
So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, Giskin cell phone adventure. Um, so when we started two, uh, more than two years ago, one of the ideas is that we were going to um, take on some projects to kind of talk, to, to train the museums on kind of how audience were changing, how new audiences could be engaged in, in cultural activities in ways that kind of leverage technology, but kind of that weren't necessarily technology centric. Um, and so we held workshops with a number of the museum educators. We brought in Nina Simon to run some workshops on kind of alternate reality gaming is what we were focused on. And through those workshops, we came up with the idea of kind of having a cell phone based adventure out in the park, um, not necessarily in the museums, um, with a number of goals. Um, this is a this is how we kicked it off, but let's see, with a number of goals. Um, one of the first goals was to kind of model the idea of gameplay for museums. So, kind of, you know, we're not necessarily as an organization kind of, we don't have an education component per se, so we don't have educators on staff. What our job is to kind of, you know, get the educators and the institutions thinking about how can they integrate technology into their process. Um, we also wanted to create a novel way for people to experience Belleau Park. Let's see if this will actually play. So we, we decided to do it on a, as a cell phone based tour as opposed to kind of creating a smart application for a number of reasons. One, one primary reason was that we could reach the widest possible audience. And so using cell phones, there's over 10 million people that come to the park every year. We wanted these games to be outside in the spaces um, and we wanted to um, you know, keep the cost low. And so one of the ways of doing that was to actually do it through cellular technology. Um, we actually used a system online called uh, phone.com and built out all of the kind of paths and stuff using that. It cost us, uh, I think, presently about $70 a month. Um, the game is based on the idea of it's a historical narrative in the park. It's actually dual layer. Um, there's a contemporary track where these two people have a device that can listen to thoughts from the past. That allows us to weave a very rich narrative based on those thoughts and lead people through the park. Um, the historical narrative is set in 1941 to 1944 when the park was part of the war effort and all of the buildings were taken over by the military and used as hospital wards. Now the majority of people that are visiting San Diego Park, well probably half of the people that are visiting are actually visitors from out of town so there's no way that they would have access to the kind of that historical data and it's not the kind of thing that there's a show up all the time in the History Museum that tells that story. Um, you know, when you engage the local community, people know about it, but it, we were also able to kind of weave in things that people didn't know about the park um, in this kind of rich narrative, and I'll play a little more. Okay, Drake, I found it. I really did. It's an Alcazar garden. You just come south out of the main entrance to the old globe and cross over into the garden. Now find the square brick monument. It should be real easy. It's the only red brick in Alcazar Garden. My marker is right in front, right by the light, okay? Got it. Alcazar Garden by the brick monument. I hope this works. Um, so part of it was to leverage gameplay to help, you know, people understand the history of the park during World War II. Oh. Okay, Pandora, it worked. It's pretty incredible, actually. But it's weird. Uh, he says he's on a bridge. <laughs> what bridge? It must have drifted. It gets said anomalies do that sometimes. Here, I'll upload it. Come on, don't be late. Not tonight. Cold and foggy out here in the middle of the bridge. Almost out of cigarettes. Off to see tomorrow for sure. Off to war, darling. Off to off some jets if you don't mind me saying so. Don't leave. 
So the historical story is about a sailor and his Japanese-American girlfriend. So it introduces kind of those elements to it. And so what we did was we worked with the various organizations to kind of pull in content that was related to that historical time period and also related to the stories of their in own individual institutions. So the way that story works is that um, it actually pulls you out into places in the park where there aren't institutions where you may not have gone unless you had a very specific reason or you were just a casual kind of, you know, like you're a runner and you're running around the park. And it introduces you to those spaces in a, in a totally different way. So the picture we have here is um, what everybody calls the stair to nowhere. Well, it turns out that there used to be a bridge there. It was called Honeymoon Bridge. <coughs> and people used to meet there to kind of propose to each other. Um, and we actually have photographs of that bridge in the History Center. Um, we have, you know, more information about kind of how the park actually was used. There's maps that people have drawn of how the base was laid out across the institutions, what the buildings were called, different names for the buildings, things like that. Um, obviously, we we're trying to appeal to a wider demographic. And as I mentioned, we we're trying to lead them into places that they might not have otherwise gone. And the way we produced the game was with they actually hired actors voice actors to produce that particular component of it. So as you heard in the overview there, or in the piece there, there was actually three different people that were acting. They recorded their messages as they kind of went around and did this um, survey. We produced press around it and actually, oh, let's see if I got a slide. Um, we had a um, uh, steampunk competition for people to actually produce the, dev the, the imaginary device that they were using for um, engaging or for detecting the signals from the past. Um, and they really got, the guys that did that actually really got into it. Um, so those are a couple of the devices there that people created that, that you know, thought that that was what the device would be like. Um, we had a, a very, we have a very strong Facebook present with it, presence with it. Um, and we've, um, the website is out there and now you can actually play the majority of the game online because it gives you access to all the codes. And we've had more than um, 8,000 people play the game so far. And they liked it. So that was basically in the system you could actually go in and record messages, um, you know, and so people would leave us not only messages like that, but hey, this marker's been moved or it's missing or I can't figure this out. And it's kind of another way of actually engaging, which is an audio-based way and kind of makes you think that a lot of audio tours should have some way of leaving a message and um, at least motivating the staff because we know that those messages actually helped us quite a bit. And so that's basically it. You can check a little bit out more if you want to actually find out about the story on giskin.org. You can play through it. Um, all the numbers are out there, and um, I think in the near future we're going to add the audio as well. Any questions? And who's next? Uh, and Perry and Sully. Good morning, everybody. I am going to talk about the way that which we have rolled out uh, essentially collaborative 
digital asset management throughout the park. Now, as, as uh, Rich and Vivian mentioned, we have 27 partner organizations with BPOC. Of those, I believe uh, 10 of them are museums, and we've got a we've got a cluster of libraries and archives in there as well. So what we wanted to do is when we when we were first founded, we we knew that we had just a, so many materials throughout the park and no way to to really digitize them, and to try to do digitization on the scale in order to present them online, we we knew that we couldn't do the highest possible capture that there is. To do so it would have taken tens of thousands of dollars to, to set up a like a, a, a phase one system or, or some other uh, big high definition uh, photography system. So we decided to go instead with, with what is called uh, rapid digitization. These rigs cost us about $5,000 a piece. We have two of them now and they're made up of just a, 30, a, um, a digital SLR Canon Mark II 5D camera with macro lens and a, a small copy stand that these are mounted on. And they're just set up with laptops and a, on a rolling cart. And we can move the cart from site to site if need be. We have one station that stays more or less permanent in, in one location. And then the other one is gets moved around as, as the organizations need them and if they've got a bulk of materials that we can just roll out quickly. Um, rapid, rapid digitization is, a, is probably about a 15 to 20 year old uh, process that was, uh, it was actually really pioneered by the El Art Gallery and, and they, we had basically taken our specs off of some, some documentation that they had provided in order to, uh, to get, these, get these going. So what are some of the benefits of doing this? We can get a, a very large bulk of images very quickly, and that helps us roll these out to the public much more quickly than we could normally have done using using a higher def camera. Uh, we can we can get as many images as possible. We mostly focus on flatworks at the moment. Uh, because those are very easy to do, very accessible. So we've done a lot of a lot of the photography collections, some of the smaller prints, transparencies using a light a light board. You just shine it up through, and you you can still capture what's happening on the transparency. Um, but it's also really really cost effective because we're able to pool resources together, and um, and centralize our services, and it, it makes for for a very flexible method of digitizing materials. So since our inception uh, in the past two years, we've done over 170,000 images and uh, roughly 1,200 videos. I should also mention our um, our video digitization rig. Uh, we we purchased a setup from SAMA, um, uh, Front Porch Digital. Uh, and basically, what it does is it captures analog analog video from um, uh, we've got a beta cam, we've got a U-Matic, we've got VHS, and it captures in JPEG 2000, dot, um, MOV files, AVIs if we set it up to do so, some basically whatever formats we, we can, and it, and it does all of these on the fly. So as a result, we come out with multiple formats, and we don't have to try to go back and, and reprocess them into the formats that we that we desire. So how do we um, how do we implement this? Actually, I'm sorry. The digital asset management um, that we selected was Piction in order to to uh, manage all of these assets, and we we went through did some interviews with three of our organizations rolled it out on a very rapid schedule. We only started the process in January of this year, and that, and that included the interviews with the organizations, doing some, some user assessment, and, and decided that we really wanted to move forward with this rapidly. We didn't have time to get bogged down in some of the minutia of every department needs. We figured that there were some baseline standards that we could, that we could 
focus on, and then we would we would adjust from there. So we decided to work with with Piction because they had a great background in working with museums, and they they were really eager to work with us on a project of of this scale and with these kind of ideas. So what we decided to do is we we put Piction on what's essentially a private BPOC cloud that's housed in our building on uh, on the Bebo Park campus. We've got a dark fiber line that's running between the organizations, and as they get online, uh, we'll be able to transfer assets fairly quickly. Um, the assets themselves are stored on a 42 terabyte server array, and uh, Piction itself is running virtually on an, a separate server uh, and each organization has their own individual instance. So let me um, show you what that looks like. So in the middle there, you can you can see that we've got <coughs> Piction sort of fueling all of this other stuff that's coming out. Um, <coughs> the piece that we're working on right now is getting getting all of the assets into into Piction from the individual organizations and pulling the metadata from all of these collection management systems. Um, but we're also using it as kind of middleware for to run the Bebo Park Commons project, which we've I know that it's been talked about uh, throughout the uh, throughout the conference. But what that will be is essentially a federated uh, collections online portal for all of the all of the park institutions. We're also using it to um, the, the Piction API will allow us to, to start feeding materials out out elsewhere onto the web as well. And so and so we're really looking at it to be a very robust solution for a lot of the projects that BPOC is working with these organizations on. And that's basically uh, just a shot of what the interface looks like. It it is like like most digital asset management systems provides the option to for the organizations to download at whatever derivative size that that we've determined or that they've determined that they would like to to have available. Um, on the right is a list of available metadata, and that's come that's coming from the collection management systems. Anyway, the advantage to to having an approach like this, particularly in a in a collaborative model, is that it's it's really quite flexible. Um, the system itself having multiple instances that then feed into the larger whole uh, really gives us a lot of options. Um, doing it in a way where we're not getting, we're not doing very detailed needs assessments means that we could we could roll it out very efficiently. And because we do so many projects in the park that rely on asset sharing, they're not, we do a lot of projects that are specific to organizations, but we're also always looking at the bigger picture, at the, the park as a collaborative group. It, so that that helps us work on projects, but it also encourages sharing between the organizations. It also helps with uh, cost sharing as well. Even though we did get a great deal from, from Piction, it means that, that the costs, the licensing fees, any other any other costs that we incur, uh, all of these organizations are are able to to help pay for the for the whole thing. So it's cost effective for them, and it's also cost effective for us. And me as a single project manager, it means that I can delegate tasks between uh, the vendors, the developers, and the staff. Um, just very quickly, I just want to just talk briefly about the process of gathering all these materials together. Um, what I do is I collect the materials from the organizations individually, centralize them in our servers, and I will clean them up. I'll, I'll do, uh, impl apply some file naming standards, and then I'll match them to the collections metadata coming out of their collection management systems. Um, I'll use a combination of two softwares, Beyond Compare, which is really cheap and amazing, and uh, a freeware program called Renamer to delete uh, derivative and duplicate assets and to rename files to, to an appropriate standard. Um, and then when we've got a new organization that's coming in, we'll create an instance for them and uh, load the, the assets and the metadata together. And then the institutions will define, define their users based on their, the preset user roles that we've, that we've given them. And then as they get to, as after training, as they get to use it, we'll modify uh, Piction and fine tune it, and uh, and so that they're more comfortable with with using it, and they're able to to start evangelizing its use within the organizations. 
between uh, between departments. And that's just a screenshot of one of the many collaborative projects that we're working on that this will fuel. So, thank you. Yeah, they're the same cards. It's just we've got one that's that that we have that we keep in a dark room, and so that one has the potential to roll around the park. But at at the moment, we've got uh, one digitization assistant, so that's her that's her office, as it were. Um, but they are just um, wire metal carts from um, I'm forgetting the name of the company. I think you, sir, but I anyway. Like, is, are they, how, do, how, how do you check them out, or how do they move around? Are they, what's the utilization of them? How, 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 what percentage of them are they sitting idle? I'm just curious. Um, currently, neither of them are sitting idle for, for any given period of, of time. We have, uh, we have one larger one that's much more difficult to move around. It's an eight-foot copy stand for larger works, and that's currently sitting at Museum of Photographic Arts, and I try not to not to move that one too much because it requires disassembly. The smaller ones, though, are much easier to roll around because they are, um, they're mobile and they're not particularly heavy. The copy stands are, are sturdy, and once they're on a, on a level surface, you can use them um, as you would any other, so we can just roll them to as needed. But um, we, haven't, we haven't had a whole lot of problems with, uh, with moving them. People just contact me. And and I make a note in in my project management software that this is where this is at any given point. Um, uh, Christy at, at Minge, she and, and one of our other partners at uh, the Air and Space Museum have been um, have been sharing one one of the stations. Air and Space has millions of photographs, and so they've. They're sort of housing one right now, and and Christy will go over and bring bring a bring a box of, of beads that they've been digitizing. Um, so so sometimes the organizations come to the cart, and sometimes the cart comes to the organizations. I think for us, we were in the process of digitization, and then um, EPOC brought a second one for us. We had our own internal one, and then they brought theirs, and so that we could rapidly digitize the majority of our collection at one point. And then, um, then it went away to a different institution. Then we found a few more things we needed to digitize, so we would just take it over to the museum who was housing because we had just a, a small amount. So it just it would vary depending on the institution. Um, yeah. What are you shooting? Are you, are, you, are you saving these as digital mag files, or are you saving them? So what we do is we um, they shoot in CR2s, which is Canon's native RAW format. Um, and then we create TIFF derivatives off of them. We were creating TIFF and JPEG derivatives off of them at, at top level quality, uh, which I believe is somewhere around 64 megabytes a piece for the TIFFs. We've stopped doing JPEG derivatives because in anticipation of moving everything into Piction because Piction will, will do the, the derivative generation for us. So they're, they're archived, essentially? They are. As a TIFF? They're archived as CR2s, oh, okay. but the derivative master are the, are the TIFFs. So we, we, keep the, we store the CR2s separately on um, uh, off-site storage. Yeah. yeah. Well, you said that you referenced instances mm -hmm. of the Um, it's all in one database, but for from the point of view of the organizations, they just have one sort of complete what to them would look like it, like an installation. So they don't see everybody else's stuff at that level. So you can kind of imagine a cloud with a bunch of little blobs under it. Um, and so when you're rolling it out on a on a server, what the what the users are, are referencing are is their own complete installation from their point of view. Um, so there's kind of a, a master installation, and then there's there's all of these little little bits that uh, that nobody else sees except for me uh, and our and the rest of our staff. But 
that, does that answer your question? I don't know a whole lot about about the server side of things, so I can't I can't answer as to the as just many of the technical specifics. But uh, that's my understanding of it. Well, okay. We got uh, Marins. You're up. So as Vivian said, I'm the senior editor at the Balboa Park Online Collaborative, and one of my responsibilities is to manage our Google grant. And as you may know, um, Google provides these grants as kind of an in-kind service to nonprofit organizations. Um, what I'll be talking about is, in the collaborative sense, the way that you can use it across departments um, and also across different organizations, which I'll get to towards the end. Um, so Google Grant means that you get free Google text ads, um, and those show up whenever you search for something um, that you've set up a campaign for. So these are two examples. Um, one is if I put in Christmas San Diego, one of our big annual events pops up, and that's December nights, and that shows up in the sponsored um, link text box at the top. Um, or if I were to put in San Diego Plays, I've set up a campaign um, for our Bubble Park calendar, and that shows up there in the text box at the, at the top. And um, you know, click-through rates vary, but oftentimes people do see that and they're drawn to it and they come through the site and end up spending a lot of time on bubblepark.org. Now within um, the Google grant, you can get a maximum spend of $10,000 per month, um, which is pretty high uh, when you think about you know, the, the way it works is that you can set up these campaigns and um, for whatever ad you set up, it can um, appear as long as the cost per click is less than $1. Um, the way that you know, Google works is that all these different companies bid for um, you know, placement and cost per click of less than a dollar just means that it takes some creativity and you're not always going to get the, um, a keyword like Los Angeles, but, um, but if you get a little creative, you can come under that. So $10,000 worth of um, $1 per click ads adds up to kind of a lot um, when you actually maximize it. Um, but Google reports that when nonprofits get these Google grants, they actually don't put much time into setting them up. Um, so the average grantee spend per month um, is around 300. Um, so it's pretty stark when you, when you look at um, kind of the potential. But um, you know, I'm sure that's due to a variety of factors, kind of a lack of knowledge. It's a, it's a bit complicated when you first get into the system, and I think people are often just kind of daunted and think, oh, I can never figure this out, and so. Um, so they don't end up doing it, or um, they do enter those kind of basic keywords and don't realize that, you know, those are cost per click of $3 and their ads are never going to show. So um, I think, and, and maybe the third reason is that with Google Grants, you also get free um, donation processing through Google Checkout. So probably many nonprofits sign up for that and um, really just add a couple campaigns because it's part of the Google Grant um, responsibilities on behalf of the applicant. So... Um, I think that's why it's often that low. Um, but we um, really invested in it, and um, this shows our performance. Um, so we've gotten, because of the Google Grants, we've had more than 17 million impressions, um, more than 300,000 clicks, and a total value of more than $170,000 um, since November 2009. And, you know, that's something that for-profit institutions would just kind of drool over, you know, when we think about SeaWorld or um, other ones, um, kind of, you know, our competitors in terms of tourism in San Diego. And so, you know, the fact that we're able to do this is just um, pretty awesome. And so for the, um, you know, recently you can see how it's hovering up there. Our monthly ad spend has been above 9000 a month. Sometimes we've actually gotten above 10000 because the way they set it up is that you max out at $330 per day. So in months that have um, 31 days, you can eke above. <laughs> so that's why you'll see that it maxes out um, right up there. So we've really, um, you know, just with 
investing in it have gotten a huge return. Um, so this is from our Google Analytics. And at this point, um, I think this is over the past year, it's comprised 11% um, of our traffic, which you'll see is more than organic traffic from Yahoo, more than organic traffic from Bing. Um, it's, it's pretty amazing what we've been able to get out of it. Okay, so what does that take? Um, I would say the number one thing is creativity. Um, so really whoever would be managing this program for your organization would just need to sit down and really think. Think about every single page of your website and what would want somebody to go to that page of your website. So thinking about kind of every theme, every, um, you know, I've kind of separated mine out into these different ad groups. Um, so you kind of set up, as you would with marketing, set up an overall campaign. Within that is ad groups, and then within those are keywords. Um, so we've done things like corporate events or weddings. Um, so somewhere to search for, you know, cool wedding venues in San Diego that are cheap. And peop some people do these huge long search strings. <laughs> um, so you just get creative and start putting these in. Um, and then that would pop up with something like, you know, plan your wedding in Belleville Park today. Um, you know, dog friendly, um, special events and projects when you have a big new exhibition starting. Just keeping that in mind and saying, oh, I should set up a Google campaign for that because if someone happens to be searching for, um, you know, toulouse lautrec exhibitions that, you know, yours could come up. Um, you can also, when you, when you set up the ad groups, um, you can do uh, location targeting. And that's how I've done ours, where certain ad groups target um, Californians, certain ones target San Diegans. And then I set up one that um, applies to anybody outside of San Diego County. So I use more general terms like um, warm vacation in February. <laughs> and then I say, like, come to San Diego, vacation paradise, visit Balboa Park. And it goes to the Balboa Park website. Um, so you can kind of think of things like that or fun family trips or romantic getaways, things that, you know, don't apply to San Diego as a whole, but because you're probably representing a museum and that's a tourist destination, you can take advantage of that. Um, and we see really high click-through rates on those. Um, and then we've also set up some campaigns targeting Spanish-speaking audiences. So um, what I've done with that is created lists of um, keywords and given them to interns um, or to, um, we have a freelance writer and send them over and then they just translate each keyword and send them back to me and I upload them into the system and then do the same thing with our ads. So I sent over, you know, here's San Diego Zoo um, ad that they just translated and I put it into the system. Um, and then keywords, the main thing with keywords is that you just have to keep thinking and um, you know once you create a list of keywords so if it's for a certain ex exhibition you know thinking of the artist and related works and things like that um, you load them in and then Google will actually help you out um, in terms of um, what once it has an idea of your ad and what people are clicking on it'll start to show you suggestions and then you just accept those suggestions and um, Google does a lot of work for you um, and these are two examples of ones where I've tried, you know, building a rock garden, and that's um, people are actually paying a dollar fifty for those clicks. But if you say building a Japanese garden, that's accepted, and that's under a dollar click. And then, as you can imagine, it took some time, um, but not all the way through. So the first arrow there is when I started in my position. Um, my predecessor put a lot of work into actually setting up the account, um, probably several hours a week at the beginning. And then um, between those two arrows, I was putting in probably four or five hours a week setting up these campaigns. Um, but that was only for maybe four months to really get it up there. And now I probably spend 15 minutes a week. Um, so it's you know very little maintenance, um, just a lot of investment towards the beginning. And with that 15 minutes a week, a lot of that is just giving interns. This is a, a perfect intern project um, because it's kind of interesting for them, but um, you know, it takes the work off you. So what I would say is, you know, hey, here's this new exhibition. I need you to sit down and make a list of 50 keywords. Um, you know, make up an ad for it, 
and um, and then they will you know just sit there and get as creative as possible thinking of these keywords, send it back to me, I copy and paste that into Google AdWords, um, and that's it, and there, and there it goes. And then, um, as I mentioned with translators, Google itself gives you these suggestions. Um, you can also, there's keyword generators out there, so you can, um, if you Google you know, free keyword generator, you can um, insert a couple of keywords and then it'll help you think of other ones, um, or it'll also mix and max mix and match different keywords. So if you did like, um, I don't know, kids photo contest, it would give you, you know, kids contest, kids photos, photo contest, and spit it back out. So um, there's kind of some interesting tools that for-profit companies use a lot, but the nonprofits often just don't think of using. Um, and then just to kind of keep going with it, what I've been doing with the account recently is setting up conversion tracking so that more than saying it's sending you know, these many hundreds of thousands of people to the site, that they're actually doing things once they get to the site. So um, adding code to um, ticket confirmation pages so you can see um, who's actually buying tickets after clicking on a Google ad um, that you've gotten through the AdWords account, and then um, store, uh, store purchases. <laughs> you can also do that for email signups on thank you pages to track conversions. Um, going back to collaboration, if you do work with other nonprofits, you can add other URLs. So we've done that um, also for blogs. If you have things that don't end, like we have things that don't end in ballballpark.org. So you can send a request to Google and add them to your account. We've also done that for Japanese Friendship Garden. They didn't have the staff capacity to do it. And we applied, and now we are able to manage some of um, their campaigns um, through our account. And then if you prove that you um, use AdWords and use it well, um, if you've had um, more than an ad spend of more than 9,500 um, over two months um, during a one-year period, and you pass a test, I had to study for the test, <laughs> um, then you can um, get an increased budget of 40,000 a month, and that is still under the approval process for us. But if we get that, then it, it'll, I mean, I think those numbers will really be staggering um, in terms of what we can send back to bubblepark.org. And um, that is it. I just added, if you don't already have a grant, that's where you sign up. And then if you have any questions, that's me. What is the application process like, or how difficult is it to get one of these grants? They award it based on, I don't know, based on what? It's, um, it's not very competitive. Like, you apply, and it's a simple application. Um, the only thing is the time. Google takes a long time to review anything, it seems. So um, it may take, I think, at this point, I think it's about four months, four to six months before but you That's like right. six or seven months. Yeah. To yeah, but I mean, yeah. for them. So I got a call and pass it a little bit. Mm -hmm. It took us less, it, so it's up and down, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, it so depends. Are basically guaranteed to get a spot, or just you have to wait? I don't know anyone who's been turned down. For Google, I mean, it's you know, it's it's a nice thing for nonprofits, but really for them, what they're doing is they're driving up the cost per click for poor for-profit companies. So the more nonprofits they get in there, the more they can charge. You know, yep, they know what they're doing. How do you, uh, how do you, I guess, balance like allocation for uh, your campaigns for like some of your partner organizations? So I don't know, are you? X amount or X percentage goes to just like the, the whole page bell mm -hmm. park network, and then you have these other smaller campaigns that are maybe more timely or based on exhibit. I don't know, is there any like cannibalization that's going on or how, I don't know, because you, know, you have that 10,000 limit right now. Mm -hmm. How do you manage that or balance all of that? Um, you know, we, we just kind of, we have, um, we, uh, when I set it up, I went through um, pretty much every major page of our site. So every organization that has a page on our site has a campaign set up for it. Um, so we did that initially, and then um, I just kind of go with major exhibitions. So uh, I don't do a lot of the smaller ones, um, but you know, IMAX movies, um, anything major that each one is doing, we put in there. And you know, I am careful because um, like the zoo <laughs> is one where when we put in zoo-related stuff, that really drives it up. So I, I do pay attention to you know the smaller organizations, and that's kind of what we have to do with all of our projects. Is just keeping that in mind. Um, so, yeah, I, I you know pretty much just try to do it as fair as I can.
Christy Ari Burgess, and I'm from Minga International Museum, and we are one of the partner organizations with the Balboa Park Online Collaborative. And before I dive into talking about our project, I would like to share with you a little more about our museum. So Minga International is dedicated to fostering the understanding and appreciation of art of the people from all cultures of the word, world. Minge is a Japanese word meaning art of the people, and um, it was coined by a Japanese scholar named Soetsu Yanagi, and again, it just means um, art of the people. We have about 20,000 items from all over the world, from about 141 countries, in a variety of media, and we don't have a lot of paintings and prints and drawings. We have some. Most of our objects are three-dimensional items. So, and the other thing about our objects is they're by um, unknown craftsmen. Most of them are made by hand and they're things for everyday life like clothing or textiles or baskets or pottery or furniture or jewelry. So all of them have an inherent beauty and again art of the people, art of the world is what we're all about. So this is a shot of the Francis Hamilton White reference library and this is where I work every day and the library contains about 10,000 volumes, hundreds of periodicals and our archives contain about 14,000 items and that is the source of a lot of our digitization projects. So what I'll be highlighting today is a video digitization project and I'll give you a little background of how um, we decide what we will digitize because just because we can digitize doesn't always mean that we should. Um, so I was thinking quite a while about digitizing our videos um, mainly because they are VHS, they're analog, um, they're not really readily accessible, they will deteriorate over time, and, um, and they can break as well. So uh, we're in a situation where you know, they're not really accessible or usable. So while I was thinking about this, I was also thinking about the fact that we don't really have the resources to buy equipment to digitize the videos. We didn't really have a lot of staff to work on it. And once we digitize the files, then we'd have to store them. So they'd be these huge files, where are we gonna store them? So luckily, about the time I was thinking about this project, the BPOC came to all the member institutions and they said to us, we want you to submit all your digitization projects or proposals for your entire museum. And that involved like, whether it was for our object collection, our library and archives. So we did. And what they found was there is a great overlap in projects um, that needed to be completed with different museums and one of the main projects was that we all had a pile up of analog tapes that needed to be digitized. So that brings us to this point and it seems really elementary to you know talk about a project in this way but almost every project is approached in the same way. You know who's going to be working on it? What are we going to be doing? We need to establish a timeline. Where is it going to be? And why are we doing it? Well the reason why we were doing it is those videos if we don't have access to those videos that document such a great part of our museum history, like our artist interviews, or maybe it's public events, or PR news spots, or docent trainings, when we lose that, it's unique. It's not like we can go back and, and refilm it. That has already taken place and it's gone. So, um, so then we need to decide um, what are the expenses, how, how much it's going to cost our museum, and what is the actual process and then, of course, our main goals, data preservation and access. So this little guy is here just to give you some visual um, relief before we go on to talk about a budget where most people glaze over. And also, it's how you often feel when you start a project. We're from a fairly small museum. We have maybe 40 people on staff. And um, you, know, you don't always have the infra infrastructure to do something. So in terms of budget, we knew that the BPOC um, were going to provide the equipment for all the institutions to use, 
They also provided us with one external drive, and we purchased three to store the smaller video files. To digitize about 300 videos was going to cost our museum about $150 per video in terms of equipment costs. And then staff at Mingay, that would be me, would digitize the videos, and our out-of-pocket costs were relatively low. So BPOC bought a unit called the Sama Solo. It came with a U-Matic deck and monitor, and it was about $50,000. And then they also purchased a VHS deck for about $200. You can get them used, and like a keyboard. So this is the miraculous Sama Solo. It's pretty large, and we had it on a cart. It was hooked up to a VHS deck, also a monitor, and also a keyboard. So basically it's a state-of-the-art patented system for video migration, and it's semi-automated where you actually have to put the tape in, but other than that it takes over, and it records the files all in one pass so that you don't have to make a bunch of derivatives yourself. It'll make the derivatives on the fly. And we bought it from Front Porch Digital, and Perrion talked a little bit about this already. So what does it do? It eliminates the need for manual video quality monitoring, meaning you don't have to sit there and watch the video to know that you're getting a good capture, which is really a blessing because the last thing you want to do is watch a video for two hours because it takes place in real time. And then it encodes for high, medium, and low quality versions at the same time. So again, it takes place in real time, and we estimated that it would take about two to three months to complete the project. And this is where volunteers and interns come in. Because when we first started out, I was running from my desk over across the room, putting the video in, and staff would come up to me and ask me what this huge piece of equipment was, and I would say, please don't touch it, and it had this humming sound. It was all very, very comical. And so um, thinking in terms of our timeline, I said, look, I've got to recruit some people to help us, and volunteers eventually, and interns eventually took over the project. And um, it's mind-boggling. They will help you with just about anything, just to help you get through it. And it was fantastic. And we imported our um, metadata into the system so that you could type in the file and your title of your piece would, or the video would pop up. And then as we got to items that weren't cataloged, we could catalog on the fly. But I'd highly recommend that you have a computer set up right next to your um, device, which we finally did, and have people catalog as they go along too so that you can have all the metadata fields that you want so that you can import them into whatever system you want. And of course, we'll have ours in the dams. So the files, um, I don't have JPEG 2000 up here, but um, it wasn't doing that when I was doing it. But we have FLV, um, QuickTime Movie, um, MFX, MXF, and XML. You can see all the files there. So it generates all these right away. And where they stored our VHS are still stored physically in the library, but we can now pack them up and put them away in archives. And I store FLV, MOV, and ProxyMob on uh, external drives in the library. And then the BPOC has all the files backed up, and they're also in the process of archiving on <coughs> some um, very it's a very uh, high quality tape. So I know this seems really obvious, but we don't do it nearly enough. Forming partnerships will greatly aid you in accomplishing your goals. And our partners are the BPOC staff and also the other institutions, and of course our interns and volunteers. So here are the results. Um, we digitized 328 um, videos. The BPOC actually digitized our umatic tapes for us. They did 52 of them. And um, we came out to 1,193 videos. And of course, we're all still receiving donations. And so um, we'll still have more videos to digitize. And in conclusion, basically, you'll, we're often faced with these challenges of not having the infrastructure to do the projects that we'd like to do. And that's when collaboration is key, because that organization may be able to provide you with the funds or uh, the piece of equipment that you need to um, 
do um, to accomplish your goals. Um, a couple of resources at the San Solo website, and then I also included um, a website about digitizing 16 millimeter film and the equipment that would be required for that, and then a just a uh, outline of technical guidelines. And then finally, if you want to contact me, this is where you can contact me. All right, thanks very much. So thank you guys for being here today. My name is Joaquin Ortiz, and I am the Digital Interpretation Manager for the Museum of Photographic Arts. Email address is ortiz at mopa.org if you guys need to reach me after the presentation. So I'm not going to lie, when they told me I was presenting about collaboration in Atlanta, I was real excited coming all the way from San Diego because I thought I was going to finally get my rap career going with Ludacris. <laughs> Needless to say, it has been a disappointing week, but I am very, very happy to be here representing MOPA. I love what we do, and uh, so we're kind of a medium, small museum. We have about 25, 25 to 30 employees, 15 full-time employees. Um, and I bring that up because you know we're, we have an operating budget of less than two million dollars. We're we can do a lot, but we can't do a lot on our own. And so in the past, we primarily had kind of a gallery-oriented experience. It's a lot of photos on the wall. Um, which is what people expect from a photo museum, but we've really been trying to push to make the experience a little bit more interactive, especially we get a lot of families at Balboa Park. We really want to make it something that is a little bit more engaging for the general public. And so we were coming up with a new show called Streetwise. We were developing it in-house, and we really wanted to do something that was a little bit different with it. We wanted to add some new technology to it. But again, uh, I had just been promoted to manage all the technical projects, and I was told I had three months to make everything brand new. And uh, we had all these cool ideas for the projects, but um, we really could not execute them on our own. And so, of course, that's where our collaboration with BPOC comes in. So one of the things that we wanted to do is we had all these rare books. Um, we were going to have two rare books that we were going to feature in the show that we couldn't let people actually touch, but they were directly related to the work that they were seeing on the walls. So we worked with BPOC. They helped us purchase iPads as well as they basically did all the research for getting how could we could install this stuff into the galleries. And then I worked very closely with Perry and Sully. And uh, we ended up using a, a special kind of kiosking software on the iPad to um, present the books in this fashion. So what we did is we took the books, had them digitized, and then turned them into HTML files. And we were able to present them as just like a book layout uh, in the galleries themselves. And this has been really cool, actually. This has been really, really successful for us. Um, you know, we would go down to the galleries and find people sitting there for like half an hour sometimes, just going through page by page, um, really getting to see a lot more of an expanded experience than what we're able to put up on the walls. And uh, it actually was so popular that we had to purchase stools after a while because we kept on seeing people. We, we set them at the ADA height, so they're about like 40 inches off the ground, which is a little low if you're standing. So we got stools, we installed that stuff, and it's been really good. We've done a lot of follow-up work doing evaluation on these, and we get about like 50% of the people that come through the doors checking out the iPads, going through the books. Um, and it was a really easy and cost-effective solution. Again, one of those things that we really couldn't figure out on our own. The other thing that we did is we really wanted to do this video installation. This is a little bit of a long story. We worked with an outside producer to get three videos produced for the show around a few themes that were coming up. The thing is, in the past, we've always kind of just like thrown them on a DVD, looped the DVD. And of course, those of you guys know, when you go to a museum, and the videos are looping, especially if it's more than like 10 minutes. It's really frustrating because you're standing there waiting and waiting and waiting. And the director was really pushing for it. She really wanted to find a way to get it so that we could, people could select what video they wanted to watch. It turned out the BPOC was already working on a similar project like this for the Hall of Champions because they have tons of video content. And so um, they had already been kind of testing out some systems in the small Hall of Champions gallery. So we cruised over and one of their interns showed us how to kind of set this whole thing up. So we ended up in the actual show putting together this little, uh, little viewing area. And uh, so we threw a TV up on the wall and what the intern showed us is uh, how to kind of construct this whole system all put together. And so it's basically made up of these buttons you see here on the right, and then the TV you see here on the left. And uh, all of it's controlled by a digital media player. And it's all 
it's all, I don't want to say hyper-technical, but again, there's a lot of weird wiring you have to do to get the media player work with the buttons and all these other things. And we, of course, wanted to have control over the design of everything. We're really particular about how this kind of stuff looks in our galleries. So we went out and found very specific buttons that matched the design of the show. They kind of had this 1960s feel. And um, for us, it was really, really critical to get this to, to, to fly in the right way. And so this gave us the control that we really needed to, to they presented the, the technical back end, but then we could put our front end on it, really make it look the way that we wanted it to look. And again, the, the media player is controlled by all this different software. You have to, you know, get the files in the correct format. And um, the thing is, again, we don't really have the time and resources to go digging through and figuring all this stuff out. And BPOC had already done a lot of that work. So it really made it a lot easier for us because we just took a model they were already working on and just implemented, implemented it in our space. So again, I'm here about collaboration because you know what, what did we learn from this? What is it that we got back out of this? What are the benefits to a small organization like ours? Well, first off, there's a shared cost. And that's really critical because cash rules everything around me. And the thing is, we don't always have a huge budget to bring by and like really figure out all this stuff. Again, you know, we can't really do experimental things at the museum. So when they're already kind of trying some of these things out and we can all share that cost together, it not only helps our institution and BPOC in, in terms of execution and other things, but then we start to also see how other museums can kind of pick this up and they have an idea of what it's going to cost, how much manpower it's going to be, all these different things that fit along with that. The other part of that is we have a larger team of people. It's critical because we basically need a lot of people working together to find solutions for these things. And the more people that we have in the room, it's easier it is for us to actually put solutions together. As you guys, for those of you who worked in technology know, you encounter a lot of bugs, a lot of other funky things that go on. And the more people that you have working on these kind of projects, the faster it goes. Again, we had three months to develop this and we did it really quickly and it came out great. And that's pretty rare for us. Usually, you know, if we had done it on our own, we wouldn't have been able to do it this quickly. Because again, it's only me who has to figure this stuff out. And I'm just, you know, I only have so much knowledge. So to have like a whole team of people, you gotta have a crew is what I'm saying. Once you get back there and have all those people backing you up, it makes the whole process a lot easier and smoother for everybody. And it really means that we can do things in a much more efficient way. Finally, it's a shared knowledge thing. And this is important for us at the park because what, you know, we're talking about all these institutions, but it should be mentioned that we only have like maybe like three or four institutions that are really large museums. Uh, the rest of them are real small like we are. And so, you know, what we've been able to do is kind of set up like, you know, we become a part of a shared network of ideas that we can kind of spread across the park. So what's happened is that now that we've started implementing some of these things, we're now working with other small institutions like Minge or like the Model Railroad Museum or other people who are interested in some of these same ideas. We can share ideas and figure out new things. And because we've already done some of the groundwork and BPOC has done a lot of the groundwork, we can start spreading this network over the park. And it really doesn't just benefit MOPA or just BPOC, but it really benefits everybody in the park, which is a rare thing because even though we're all in one big location, we actually don't really work together that much in the past, and now it's really becoming critical for us in this new, in this new age of things. That's how we got to engage visitors, is really have like a shared community of, of ideas and new things, and create a, a user experience that really matches across the, the spectrum of museums in Balboa Park. So I want to thank you guys for coming out today, and uh, we're really excited to uh, continue working on with BPOC about these collaborative projects. And um, you know, we've essentially taken a lot of these ideas and kept running with them. And uh, it only happened because of that model that they were able to build for us and uh, help us get that off the ground. So thank you guys for being here today. Board. It's made up of the directors of all of the institutions. Um, 
you know, and then again, from a leadership perspective, I mean, I come at it, or have come at it the same way that I come at, you know, IT positions within large organizations, which is potentially is the best, is a good place to build a collaborative too inside of a single organization. Um, and our approach as an organization is to say, you know, we're actually in it for the organizations that we're supporting. We believe in what their mission is as opposed to just something that we want. And whether it's an independent organization kind of helping a bunch of organizations, which, you know, at the end of the day, you know, if I look at, you know, the budget size, it's like some of the departments that I've supported in other organizations, you know, size-wise. Um, you know, it's always a how can we help you kind of thing, do your job better. I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's a recipe for success in a number of different areas. But those institutions have to recognize that the work that you do is work that they need to have done. That's true, and, and they don't all, they, they, believe me, they don't all do that. But usually there is, um, we don't let that slow us down to a large degree. Um, you know, we, there are a bunch of organizations that do understand that. They do understand that audiences are changing and some of the things that we're doing, you know, are what they need to do in the long run. And before we got there, it wasn't that they didn't want to do things like that. They couldn't because they didn't have the resources. And by sharing the resources to, together, they figured they can do it. And one of the things that that does is that, you know, it allows the organizations that don't necessarily get it to go, oh, well, maybe now I get it. Because we don't, again, we don't let it dissuade us. We just, we know what, we're well versed in what other institutions are doing across the country. We're involved. We're looking. We're watching. We're talking, asking questions, and so we bring those answers back and keep trying to apply them. And you know, it's not. And we also have a relatively high tolerance for failure, so we'll go out and fail, you know, on a regular basis, um, but we tend to succeed more than we fail. So you know, we we don't mind doing that. I mean, I. There's been some big projects that I've invested money in where they just didn't, you know, what I was thinking would happen didn't happen. And, you know, in retrospect, you go, oh, well, that makes sense, but I didn't know that when I started because I didn't have a reference point from other organizations doing it. And so what Joaquin was saying about, you know, us going out and experimenting, a museum will come and say, you know, we want to do, we're trying to figure out how to do this. And what normally happens inside small organizations is they, they're looking looking at they're trying to read online but nobody's touching and feeling and actually doing so we look at it we say oh it's a thousand dollars let's just get it and see if it works and if it does then we really have you know we that thousand dollars pays off in tens of thousand dollars worth of kind of oh we're doing this and it's, it's working um, and if it doesn't work it's a thousand dollars that we can't spend on something else obviously but we're not afraid to kind of take that risk so that we know. We figure it's the same as paying someone to look at that for a long period of time online and like kind of just keep going, I don't know. Or the loss of opportunity that you have by not being able to do it. So. Hey, Harold, to follow up on that, um, I mean, it kind of does take somebody to be willing to take the, the risk on that. And Mope was really willing to try it. We're, we were small space. Like, we, we have to innovate at this point. And so we're kind of willing to try some new things out. And when I started doing this, like, a little bit more than a year ago, working with BPOC, there wasn't as many places on board. But what's happened is, as Rich has consistently demonstrated success, more people have kind of come around to the idea. And they're so flexible about working with our mission and our vision, like he was saying. You know, we, they don't come in and impose things on us at all. We come to them and say, hey, we're thinking about doing this, you know? And they find a way for us to do it. And that's a, a rare opportunity for us. It makes it a lot easier. And the collaboration is not forceful at all. And that's why I don't think we get in a lot of battles about it. But, but trust seems to be an important thing. Absolutely. And yeah. as organizations learn to trust that you really can get work done and you have deliverables, then then the relationship expands. And he has to show that he can do it, and that's the, where the trust comes from. It was a little risky for us, and people, I think, at our museum, our administrative was, administration was supportive, but some of the other people were a little dicey. Like, why are we doing this? Why can't we just do it on our own? But now, though, again, we've shown that being successful, it's built more more value into the institution to do these kind of things. But then, of course, across the park, it's done that as well. So. Well, the other thing about success and trust is knowledge. We gain knowledge, and many of these projects are first time. So when you do something first, a collaborative with technology for the first time, you gain experience, you gain understanding, and it gives you confidence to do the next thing or step up to the plate in a bigger way. 
Yeah, I mean, I, by the time we, we did that kiosk at the at MOPA, mm -hmm. we had already rolled out 17 of them at the sports museum. And, you know, and, and the way that, I mean, the sports museum, did, again, didn't have any kind of major set of resources to do that. We were just, they had a bunch of video kiosks that were broken. Um, some that were working, some that were broken, and we were just kind of embarrassed because our offices are in the same building. So we put an intern on it. We got them to spend some money on the hardware after we bought one piece and tested it out. And you know, by the time we'd done 17, it actually gets pretty easy. And that's the same thing for a lot of the other projects. I mean, we've launched 22 websites. Well, you know, after the first four, we know exactly what to expect. I mean, you know, we know where the where most of the pitfalls are, and we plan for those. Um, you know, after you've uh, digitized your first 50,000, you know, images, you're kind of like, okay, you know, this is the thing we should do, and this is the thing we shouldn't do. Um, you know, so that makes it a little easier. I'm curious, I guess, about how the collaborative was formed, why it was formed initially, and how it's funded, because it seems like there's a little bit of a built-in infrastructure because all these organizations <coughs> exist within Balboa Park. So you can say, okay, it makes sense for all of us to pull our resources in some way and get together. But for some of us uh, where we might want to collaborate <coughs> with other organi organizations in our city, how do we go about doing that? And you know, what does that infrastructure look like? So. I can actually give a specific example to your museum, because I used to work there. Um, when I, the, the way kind of this whole process started, there's actually two components to it. One is um, there's a funder in San Diego that has a strong interest in supporting these organizations and getting it to work together. So that was the kind of seed funding for making this happen. So basically this foundation set aside $3 million over a three year period, which ends in April of next year, to kind of get this thing up and running and see if could be made sustainable. Um, the other component to that is that the institutions contribute income, you know, so they're actually paying for some of the services. Um, and then the third component is that we've been able to raise additional funds because of the uniqueness of the model. Um, when you get back to kind of, you know, the idea around the, that that you know this is unique and it can't be replicated because it's you know who else has a park with 84 cultural organizations, you know. 14 museums, kind of the big thing. And originally I was at the Albright Knox as the CIO, and that's where she's from. Um, and this was back in 2001. And I had gotten a bunch of museums in the region to kind of agree on the collaboration of sharing a, a, a collection management system. I, I was never able to line up the funder to support that effort. But it, it's even more clear to me now, kind of implementing a BPOC, that um, to a certain extent, the geographic piece is nice, but it's not required. Um, in fact, it creates some of its own issues because these museums are kind, of, are kind of feel like they're competing sometimes for the same visitor that's walking by the door outside. Um, and a big piece of what we've done is this effort with dark fiber and actually connecting the museums together. And while it's slightly more expensive the, when the distances are greater, it's not actually insurmountable from a cost standpoint. And again, the idea that one, you know, one centralized organization could get good at doing a bunch of websites is not, doesn't, you don't really have to be in the next building for that to work. Um, so, you know, we, as, an, as a case in study, most of my developers actually don't come into the office on a daily basis. They work from home and they code, you know, from wherever they need to be. Um, and we're still able to kind of pump that stuff out the door. So I don't think that it's necessarily a geographic thing. I mean, I think it's it's nice actually to be able to walk to a meeting over at MOPA in 10 minutes. Um, but these days, you know, with Skype and with all of the other technology that we can use, all of us use, you know, development firms or resources that are not local to us. I mean, you know, we were able to buy a, a digital asset management system from a company in Australia because it's easy to get on Skype and work with them. Um, and, you know, make it happen even though they're not right next to us. And I think it's the same model. Securing the funding that's key. Well, you know, I mean, it's a pretty common thread among funders that they want to see us do things more efficiently and work together. So, I, I mean, I, I, I don't think it's, I think the reason that I wasn't able to obtain the funding in Buffalo was because of the uniqueness of the concept. The technology was relatively new. It wasn't kind of as tight, you know, like kind of as common. 
where everybody has a smartphone and everybody's doing these things, and they know that things are changing really rapidly from a technology standpoint. Um, that's changed. You know, I think there's a lot of funding at the national level to kind of facilitate this kind of stuff. And I think there's, you know, power in numbers. And so really it's about the organizations getting together and saying this is what we want to do, which is a little harder. I mean, it is hard to do, but it's not possible. It's not also, it's not only getting funding. Um, there are things like shared resources where which figured, determined that there were several of us using the same collection management system. And it's actually going to that company and saying there's five of us using it. Is there a way to um, have one cost for all five museums versus yeah. each individual museum having their own cost? And that eventually saved us all money by going in as a group versus individually. Well, we also look at things that they're paying for anyway and see if we can figure out a way, a way to do them cheaper. I mean, that's an example. Um, right now we're in the process of deploying a, a shared phone system. So they'll have several institutions kind of on the same, same PBX. And they're already paying for phone service. They're already paying for maintenance on a phone system. So we just aggregate that. We're doing the same thing with internet access. Go to. Hey, Rich. So I'm going to remind you <coughs> before I ask this question that I think the session is recorded. <laughs> uh, but I, I think you're absolutely right. You know, the willingness to fail is a huge thing. And I'm wondering whether I can get you to tell us one story about where it didn't work out and what conclusions you drew, why it didn't work out. Is there anything you can extrapolate from that that helps you now be better at picking the winners? Well, actually, I mean, I did a whole session, so, which I think was recorded too on it. So uh, I must have missed that. Yeah. <laughs> but you can catch it online. Um, so we did a, uh, a translation project. And one of our areas that we focused on is, is building out content management systems with the idea that we could build components and then reuse them. And so the idea here was, you know, there's a couple of areas where we've done it. Calendaring is one of them. Um, collections online we're working on. Um, an individual module set that could be reused across institutions. Um, we're working on, we've done a, a lot of um, retail and online ticket buying that's worked really well. And of course, we were going to do translation because that makes sense because it's just a set of modules, right, that you install and then you get a translator and they translate it. And we failed pretty miserably in that. We started off with the Japanese Friendship Garden site because I thought, oh, it'll be cool to have two languages. I can do Spanish, which is obviously regionally half of the visitors to the park prefer to do some of their operations in Spanish, so that should be work. And then it's a Japanese garden, so I can throw Japanese at it and it should be good. And there's a couple of things that we failed at. One is um, in building online systems that support multilingual, if your programmers don't actually understand what the language is, even though the translator's done it and it's broken, you don't know that it's broken and you can't, and it's really difficult to fix. And the second part of it is it's not repeatable because translation systems built into websites are very integrated into menu systems and every website pretty much has a unique menu system. And so you have to rebuild that part almost every time. And so at the end of the day, we spent about $50,000 and didn't we just recently pulled all of that mess that we had built into that site out and disabled it. And our idea was that we would be able to kind of do this, model it, and that the museums for, you know, we might be able to translate a couple of the sites and then the museums for a limited amount of money could actually keep it up. Um, but the, the technology challenges kind of just overwhelmed us. So what we did, instead of trying to do that again, we still wanted to serve that market. So we readjusted our resources and we created a Spanish language blog creating original content about the park and a Spanish language Facebook page and those and then a Spanish language ad campaign which Marin didn't touch on but that's another piece of what we do um, and we did some re we did a little, some additional research which we should have probably done in the beginning which was which is one of the downsides of kind of being aggressive about you know moving into spaces um, which is that uh, we noticed that even though we did the translation and got it working on that site it um, didn't really move the needle as far as what people were looking at. And we found out from, you know, uh, kind of some additional research that most Spanish-speaking people don't go to the Spanish part of the site because they assume that it's outdated because nobody has the resources to do it unless it's like, you know, a big organization. Um, but we're still interested in kind of trying to figure that out. It hasn't, we know that it's still a problem. And so we continue to look at it and watch as kind of some of the modules that are being developed keep improving. There's some translation companies that are actually developing their own module integrations where they partner with you and their programs, programmers do speak the languages. 
Um, so we're still keeping an eye on it, but you know, that, that was a big waste of time. It was hard. It took a lot of my time. It took a lot of Christina's time. Um, we didn't, you know, we just didn't anticipate how hard it was. So, and you know, we're willing to talk about it. We put it into, I put it into a session and talked about, you know, this is what we did. And we didn't do too well. And this is why we think we didn't do too well. Um, you know, but we keep moving and kind of move on in, the, in a new direction and make sure that we can kind of figure out a different way of serving some of that same market, which has been relatively successful the last the last two months. It's been about as effective as our regular language blog on a kind of cost basis, um, and, and the trend is right. So that's what we've been looking at. Um, I guess a little bit different than failure, I'm just curious, are you able or have you been able to build a profile of maybe projects or processes that are maybe not good candidates for collaboration? Maybe, uh, in other words, like things you've said no to. So one of the, the partner organizations came forward with a proposal or asking for your help, and you just, for whatever reasons, told them no, or um, I don't know, I'm just trying to understand, like, if, like where do you draw the line between like, you know, what the partner organizations do on their own versus what you guys offer to do for them in the technology sphere or whatever? Well, I mean, we felt like, you know, we do, like I said, we've launched 22 websites. Um, we don't design the websites for the people. So we say, you know, that's unique enough to your organization that if you want to invest in a design, that's kind of your business. So there's a, you know, kind of a really clear way we can draw a line there. Um, some of the things that we've figured figured out that don't work as well, we can have some really great ideas about how to integrate technology into an institution and things that they probably should be doing. But if the institution at the end of the day doesn't have the kind of wherewithal to step up to the plate and be a partner, those projects, while we may technically be successful, um, kind of don't go anywhere. So we've launched a couple of sites um, fo focused on video that, well, they work, and they're cool, and they highlight the museum's content. You know, if the museum doesn't continue to add video, or they don't continue to kind of engage, or they don't, you know, continue to care for that, it's not going to go anywhere. Um, we've had some institutions that don't have, you know, kind of a lot of a lot of wherewithal where they're like, we want to do a video wall, and we're like, a video wall of what? And they're like, well, I don't know, just a video wall. You know, we got some money, we want to do a video wall, yeah. and so we just keep. <laughs> We keep working at them to say, you know, to really refine that down and kind of determine what content, and, you know, they've been asking for a year. And we're willing to kind of partner with them, and they have the money to do it, but they don't really have an idea of why it would be a compelling reason to do so. We've been kind of not doing that. I don't know if that's a good example. Is that an institution with some mission drift? Yeah. They don't know why they're doing it. Yeah, and I mean, there's, a, I mean, all of us have a little bit of mission drift, you know, in different areas. Um, so yeah, it's a definitely a case of that. I think too that also part of our job is to manage expectations. Too, we a, a fairly high percentage of us come from museums and, and love museums and understand how museums work. And and when you've got organizations that aren't used to using technology or are, are learning about it, it's very exciting. Um, and so so what we the other part of it that we can do is we can say. Well, yeah, that's great. Like Rich said, video wall would be fantastic if you've got, yeah. you know, if you're if you're doing this with it or if you're doing this with it. But if you don't know what the this is, so maybe they're asking you what a good fit is. Yeah, I mean they do that a lot, but like you know, this particular museum, we're not necessarily experts in the content that they provide. We have everything from anthropology to model railroad, and so you know, um, we have a lot of, we have a lot more art museum experience between our staff than we do other. And, and again, it doesn't, even that doesn't really matter as much as they need to own it. Yeah. So if we feel like they are gonna own it, that's what that's one of the lessons that we've learned, that they need, they really need to own whatever they're proposing. And it can't be just, you know, the director sending me an email and saying, I saw this and it's cool. They really need to kind of, you know, show us that they have a plan for how they're gonna, you know, kind of get there and support it. I mean, to a certain degree for the special projects. I mean, there's a lot of projects that inherently we know are just good for them. So more bandwidth, how can that be a bad thing? Because they all need that. Um, you know, computers that work every day when you come in, you know, that's a that's just a, a clear a clear need. Um, 
but when it comes to the more specialized things, you know, you work with an organization like WOPA, which had, which is very clearly focused on their mission. It's, it's a lot, way, way, way easier than if you're, you know, talking to a director and he's going this way, and, and then the person that's supposed to be responsible for it is like, you know, I'm not going to do that because the directors only control the institutions to a certain degree, and you know, the staff can say, you know, can come up with a hundred reasons why it's not going to work. And then we just don't, we don't spend time with that institution. We, we do take a lot of the path of least resistance. So if, we, if there's a project that's good to do that we think should be modeled, we do it with the institution that's going to be the easiest one to work with and the, more, and the most likely to succeed because that's just, you know. And then if the other two institutions come on board and say we want some of that, sometimes after we've done the first project and we kind of know how much resources it's taken, then we can scope out something that's an appropriate, an appropriate charge for that institution to really determine whether they're interested or not. And I think it goes both, way, both ways in order to have a successful collaboration. There's times where Rich will come to us and say, what about this technology? And I'll say, um, how does it fit with what we're trying to do? Yeah. And it may not fit with us at that particular moment. The QR codes was a good example. At the time that he presented, we weren't ready for it. Six months later, we were ready for it, and we implemented it very quickly at that point. And it's a scale thing too, like you know, like QR codes. He suggested it. We knew already kind of had a good idea how to do it, so we didn't need to collaborate on that necessarily. We do a lot of other digital presentations and interactives where we don't work well with BPOC because we can do it in house pretty easily. But when it comes to expanding beyond our general circle, we definitely need that support system. Right. And like with the QR codes, our top administrators weren't ready for it. Some of us were ready for it and knew about it, but our top level weren't ready for it. And so it took a, several months to get them to realize what the potential was. So the fit was really a matter of, of sort of cross-institutional understanding. I would say that's a huge thing. Like our almost all like all of our administration is highly supportive of us working with them. You know, so it makes it, it makes it easy for me because it, it, there's a reason I'm I'm there all the time. You know, and I have that support from above Vivian all the way down below me. So and another piece of it is you know that the at least I hope it seems seems to be the case that a lot of the directors look at me as, as a peer. And so what I'm able to do, staff actually come to me with things that they're trying to move forward in their organization. And I help work with them to kind of convince their administration to actually do the projects by, you know, showing peer-related examples. Um, we we do a lot of collaborative fundraising with the institutions to kind of move these things forward. So, you know, we're constantly scanning the, the funding horizon and saying, you know, what what funders are out there, what projects, you know, would they fund that fit into the the goals and desires of the institutions as well as the collaborative infrastructure model. And then when there is one, I mean, it's it's one of the best things, and Mary can back up on this, is that, you know, we can call five institutions to get five letters of support in a matter of days. Um, so we're very nimble as far as being able to apply for projects because of the, again, the trust factor. Um, you know, they don't, they don't have to know every detail for us to go out and put a proposal in that's going to benefit them. Or on the other side of it is, you know, we get daily requests for letters of support and for review and for additional, like, you know, can you fill, can you help us with the technical section of this grant proposal so that we get it right, so that we, you know, we know what we know our programming piece. We don't really know, understand this particular part, and you're going to be doing it probably anyway. You know, we want to write you into this grant so that, you know, and then what we'll do a lot of times is try to shift it so that it actually is not just beneficial to that institution, so that it's actually a more of a collaborative fit and you know kind of raises all the boats, even though this institution may be the primary recipient of the funding. I want to state for the record, though, I'd never go behind my boss's back directly to Rich to get a project done, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one final question before we end the session. Well, this is a question for everyone. I was curious. I, I think one thing, one word that you all said was the word interns and volunteers. And specific to interns, I was just curious, uh, informal survey, like, are, are your interns paid or unpaid or both? Or who here has paid interns? I guess that's really what I'm wondering versus unpaid. 
pay? Yeah, pay we, have, we have both, actually. Okay. I mean, I'll tell you, there's a real, we have a really interesting program, which is called uh, it's our Wounded Warrior Internship Program, Technology Internship Program. It's um, in, in Balboa Park, in addition to all of these nonprofit institutions, there's a naval hospital, it's, um, and there's a Wounded Warrior Battalion there. People are coming for rehabilitation from um, injuries they received both in the wars as well as other places. Um, and generally, you know, they maybe go. They're, they're active duty military. A lot of Marines, some sailors, um, and they're going through these rehabilitation. But they're, you know, they don't they don't have anything else to do other than you know go to their doctor's appointments and then hang out in the room, play video games, things like that. And a lot of them are going to be discharged after they're done. So we've created a program uh, where kind of gener generally we have about seven active interns from that pro from that thing. They come over. They get. Um, online and on the job training on technology. Um, some of them have some experience in some technology, some of them don't. And then we put them to work on projects for the museums. And so, first of all, they're military, so they kind of are the kind of people that show up on time to do their work. They're, un they're unpaid in the sense that we're not paying them, but they're actually drawing a check because they're active duty military. Um, and we've been able to build that out because that, that project was funded by a, um, a local foundation that normally funds workforce development, which it is and medical related things, which it also is. We were able to get a coordinator, pay for the training stuff. And because we have a kind of internship coordinator, that allowed us to expand out into other programs where we're, you know, we're pulling in workforce development. Uh, we've taken some of those interns as they've been discharged and started paying them um, to work for us because we've actually, you know, they, they're, they ended up being really good. Um, we will also partner with um, Highlands New Mexico University which is, uh, has a really cool AmeriCorps program where they have um, a, a master's program in, in media studies and those guys come out with you know really good experience and AmeriCorps pays for half of it and we pay for the other half. So well, let's see, I'm trying to think. Oh, and then we have in San Diego, we have a series of schools called High Tech High where we get high, t high school students that have been kind of immersed in technology uh, for three weeks straight, they have to work 40 hours a week, and so we always have a couple of those around there putting that, are, that are working on things. Um, and I've always had really good success with internship programs. So like, just recently, I mean, I've had a couple of comments at the conference, we're advertising for an IT director, and it's like, you know, you're supervising three employees and 10 interns. And that's one of the ways that we keep the cost low and kind of spread this stuff across. But on the other side, we're actually giving these people really good experience on the job training, um, you know, instead of, like I said, some of them are actually paying. And that's one of the biggest things that we found, especially with working with them and internally what we do is that when they're getting to work on big projects where they, they kind of self-manage and that they're, they feel like they're getting new experience and they know they're contributing, they're not as worried about getting paid a lot of the times because they feel like they're really building their skills and their resumes. We're seeing a lot of civic engagement out of guys that probably wouldn't have been that into going into museums because their work, their work product is showing up in exhibitions and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And if you're looking for funding, the fact that you know we'd be training them, or you would potentially be training them in technology-focused, you know, building those kind of skills that are marketable. Um, if you're looking for workforce development funds, that you know carries a lot of weight when you say, hey, you know, we can transition them into these kind of programs, or um, you know, help them get these kind of certifications. Um, you can really make a case. Bravo! Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.